I'm hanging out with my buddy Lance this weekend, and uh, you may have already seen we've been out there in the shop playing with the shaper. He's got his little 16-inch G&E that we've been working with, and while I was here hanging out with Lance, we wanted to talk about a little bit of scraping. That's a, that's a subject that's uh, gotten brought up a lot lately, and uh, I've done a little bit of practicing with scraping, but Lance has been uh, practicing scraping for several years now. And I think he's gotten very familiar with it. He's gotten very good. And uh, he's definitely, it's a, it's a passion of his of, of doing scraping. So uh, I wanted to get with him and spend a little time with him and m try to make a, uh, at least an introduction video about the basics of scraping and what it is and what, what it's used for. And then maybe some of the tools and then some of the, we've got some samples here of some of the projects that, that anybody would typically scrape in. and, and uh, I think we're just going to have a conversation about scraping and, tr and try to show something. Yeah, and try not to make it like, I'll, I'll do my very best not to make it seem like a school lecture or something like that because yeah. I want you guys to be really interested in this because I, I yeah. think the more people that get interested in this, the more old machines will be saved and there's a ton of fun stuff to do in the shop. Mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe I'm just a nerd, but th we're this all, is... We're all nerds in the shop. Yeah. It's stuff that we nerd out on. But this stuff is something you can do at home. It's great exercise. And then you, you can look back at what you did. And, and, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's functional. And, uh, and you can teach somebody else to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I, think, uh, I think Lance is a great person to try to explain some of this. And uh, so let's just go ahead and dive into it, man. What you, what you got? Well, the uh, first thing I want to make sure everybody understands is uh, I'm not a machinist. So when I have machinist <laughs> questions, I do want, you know, 1-800-A-BOMB or, you know, in all I, fairness to I, Keith, 1-800-Keith Rucker, you know, sometimes I'll call and, and I'll be like, hey, how do I handle this? Um, I am a veterinarian and I, I kind of fell in love with metal work and, and fabrication and things like that um, as sort of a pastime from, from my stressful lifestyle. Yeah. And so that's how all this got started. Um, and, and I think that's a common theme with a lot of guys out there. Yeah. You know, it's sort of an outlet to mm -hmm. get away from the day job and right. something to enjoy yourself with. And this yeah. can be part of that too. And I, it, when it comes to scraping, I'm not all self-taught. I did it for a couple of years and um, reading, watching as much video as I could, getting experience, and that was probably five, six years ago. And then... Um, sought out Richard King to try to get some formal training and that's one thing I want everybody to know if you really want to do this and do this well I think you need a mentor or a couple of mentors I've been blessed to have a few people help me um, in the last years and and it's just been awesome it's catapulted my knowledge um, but I am NOT an expert I just want to share this because I'm excited about it I love what I do with this and anybody can do it mm -hmm. like that's why that's why I said I would do this yeah so and, and I'm not you, an expert and you've had a lot of requests though because you're sharing yeah. this kind of stuff out there more than I am I, I you know I took yeah. the training class but I haven't really been keeping up my practice yeah Lance does so he gets people that's that's uh, been requesting hey can you guys make a video right and that's, I have that's what this is right and so that's my background I did a class with Richard which was the first class you took, mm -hmm. you and I and Keith all took the same class, yep. it was at Keith's shop. Yep. And then I went back and took a second class and then, I, and then I went back and helped out at two more classes. So I've got a couple hundred hours of like sort of on-site formal training with Richard King, big shout out to him, I appreciate his help. Mm -hmm. And then there's been a couple other people that I have access to, I have a bunch of stuff to our right here, I don't know if the camera can see it, that I bought from a lifetime, you know, machine tool rebuilder yeah. and um, he's been super helpful to me as well he's a great guy I, I'm not saying his name because I didn't ask if I could okay. um, but yeah so anyway I wanted to start out with what are the reasons you would scrape so yeah. I don't want to overlook art because this stuff is beautiful and if somebody had an artistic flair and wanted to add this as like to an art piece of metal I think that's a valid reason to learn to scrape yeah. and that's easier because there's really no math um, you know, the other reasons are machine tool repair or making uh, measuring devices or, or reference devices or reference pieces like this box mm -hmm. channel. Yeah, that's yeah. a t tunnel, tunnel block okay. or a, a tunnel square or a riser block, but uh, that's something that you would typically use just to, to make a riser block. Like a setup. A setup block, yep. Yep. but Lance has uh, scraped it in within two tenths. 
<laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, but this was a good teaching lesson, and we'll talk about that later because this is something somebody with virtually no money can do for yourself, and you only need a surface gauge, this, and a hand scraper. So, so the one thing I want to say is mentorship and and consistency. So when you're learning to scrape, and we'll try to cover some of the details. I think you, you need to remember that it's just repeatable consistency. It's like golf or anything else. You have to figure out how, what feels right to you and the result you want. And the more consistent you are, the faster you're going to learn that trade. And so what are the tools? Let's like show tools here. So the first thing most people get is this is a, a Biax made by Depra hand scraper. And so I don't know. Not sure what the camera's gonna pick up. Yeah, it I takes insertable blades, so <laughs> knocking stuff down. That's, you know we're doing real stuff here. Um, so this is like uh, a fairly wide 25 millimeter blade. It's 150 millimeters long. And it's a carbide tipped. Correct, right. yeah. And so this fits in this uh, handle, and, and this would be sort of the basics. That the Allen wrench is right there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this one here. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. okay. I should tighten it down. So you know this, your brain and, and and a piece of cast iron is really all you need to get started. So let's say I don't remember what those sell for, Adam. Do you? Um, like uh, Ninety or a hundred dollars maybe. Yeah. And so if you did, plus the you know the the carbide tool is an addition. So, I mean, this is probably, the, the, the carbide tip tool is going to say, let's just say $100 for this. Yeah. This is something that you could probably make yourself. Yep, and that's why. Yeah, this it's, is this is one that I believe Keith made, and he gave me right, right there. Just a file handle, piece of flat steel, mill a couple clamps, do some drilling and tapping. you got a clamp there that you can clamp this together with. So there's a hand scraper. And we are super happy to share this file if you want to make one. The, one of the important things, and Adam and I were just talking about it before we turned the camera on, is the thing that I think people don't realize, this is what I feel important. There are Anderson scrapers out there that are very stiff, but I think, and again, probably biased because the people that taught me, you need something that has flexibility or feel. I made my own. This is exactly the same thing. Do not look at the welding back here. Um, <laughs> But, and the, I'll show you the reason for the pad here in a little bit. Actually, Adam will, because he'll scrape with this. Um, mine's just about 25 thousandths thinner, and so mine's even more flexible. You can see it, okay? Yeah. And, and this, so... This one's pretty rigid right here. Right. And so I, but I made this after I had scraped for, you know, quite a while and knew what, what I wanted it to feel like, because you can actually feel what you're cutting. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? We're actually just taking a piece of carbide and we're taking a chip. We're making a chip on a piece of cast iron. That's really all that we're doing. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that on there. Yeah, I was just showing. What the, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna we're gonna set up. We've got a test piece that yep. we'll, we'll use to do some scraping on. So I'm gonna show some examples of what I would what nots. So these are actually brazed on carbide scrapers that I were sent to me and I actually sharpened these for a fella. And I think he's, I don't know that he'll ever scrape with them, but he just wanted them sharp. Um, these would be examples of things that could, could I take these or could a, a, a even more experienced scraper take these and use and make these useful? Sure, but you need a lot of experience and knowledge. These are very stiff, um, you know, very, very, very wide radius, yeah. you know, a little bit tighter way tight you could yeah. get into trouble with this one and so <laughs> definitely get in trouble with this one too because of the corners and so um so i think the, the equipment's important and you can make most of it yeah i think that's the message here yeah you want to talk about the biax yeah sure so so this is this is once you step up and you really this this would be for power scraping right here mm -hmm. so if you want to step away from the hand scrapers and you want to step it up to speed up the operation. That's really all this does is just speeds up the, the process using a, a Biax scraper. And uh, I don't know, what do you want to say about that? Well, I think that's just, this just removes a lot of the workload. The reason for the pad, I thought I would say it, is that when you're hand scraping, you really want to use your body. Mm -hmm. Because, and I, 
you can just use your arms to hand scrape, but yeah. I'm certainly not in good enough shape to, to scrape for two hours that way. And so when I'm scraping, I have my, you know, project in front of me and I'm actually using my entire body yep. to, to, to hand scrape those things that I hand scrape. But I have to be honest, 98% of what I do now is with a power scraper. Yeah. I'm super comfortable with it and you can get jobs done. I don't know, somebody probably has done the math. Yeah. 90 times faster. This, for, for anybody that's not familiar, this works like a, uh, like a sawzall. It's a reciprocating motion here on the end. So your carbide blade goes in the end and once you turn this on, this blade is just moving and you can adjust the stroke and you can adjust the speed. And then, so once you're set up with this, you know, you got this a little tight for my hand there, but yeah. and you're just, and you're just running across and letting this do the forward and back motion of the cut. Right. And when we get to the test piece, um, I'm going to do a quick overview of like radiuses and uses, but we'll, We'll uh, talk about length of cut, width of cut, depth of cut, and do some stuff on the test pieces because okay. I think it'll make more sense when people see you scraping and then um, why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, as a brief preview, when you look at a blade like this, this is a little shorty. Um, well, that does kind of have more of a, 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 a smaller radius on it. But you would traditionally take a part, you would measure your part, and I'm, I'm going to oversimplify this and um, determine where it would need to be scraped. And you would typically want to start with a fairly wide or larger radius tool. Yeah. It's covering a, a larger scraping area because if you grab that piece of paper and maybe you can just do two seconds of boring school paper or that pen. Yeah. So when you have, and I'm not an artist, folks, I hopefully the screen will pick this up. <laughs> if you have a very large radius, kind of like the earth, you're going to have a larger contact area when that touches, you know, less depth of cut over the width of the blade. So you're going to have a larger contact area. And, and, and you know, this gradually changes. Traditionally, it's um, nine, uh, 120. These are all in millimeters, 120, 90, 60. I think they would even go down to 40. Um, and so as this radius becomes smaller, you get, yeah, I told you I wasn't an artist. You get a narrower cut. And so when you are trying to get a large surface area flat, you're going to want to take more material. You're not necessarily going to take super deep cuts, but you can. And as you go towards finishing, you're going to want smaller and smaller cuts. And the goal, everybody talks about it. This would be a good place to talk about it. They talk about PPI. So it's points per inch, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's, well, more is better. Well, it, it, more isn't necessarily better, Adam. It's, it's like um, you have to decide what it is that that surface is going to be doing. If it's a mating surface, say, between a column on a, a piece of machinery and a base, well, PPI on that can be low, it can be 10. Mm -hmm. But you want a lot of good contact area that's all in the same plane. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. If it's a machine like a surface grinder, that, you're, that, that, that those waves are going to be constantly rubbing back and forth 16, 20 hours a day, well, then you do want your points per inch high it'll have longer wearability. Um, you still need a certain percentage, 40 to 50% probably contact, overall contact, but that machine will last a lot longer. Yeah. So, more talks a little bit about contact and points per inch, and they actually, in the beginning of their book, Moore's book, you know, it describes this, uh, like for the surface plate I did for you, mm -hmm. um, I kind of stopped at 30 to 35. You're not going to use that a lot. Yeah. And it had like 60% or more contact and it was in a nice flat plane. Yeah. So that's good enough. If I made it 50 or 60 points, which would be crazy tough to do, it wouldn't be any better than it is. So, yeah. so um, common simple projects I wanted to talk about. So we, we, we discussed simple hand scraper that you can make we talked about and and I would suggest people buy if you're going to spend the money buy the blade buy buy a Daper Biax blade and then 
I'm going to talk like the most common project most people do like in a scraping class would be something like this. So it's just an angle block that you would use for setups of some sort. And so I, I honestly do not remember when I did this. I have no idea. Um, we'll, we'll talk. We may have time today to talk about a little bit of step scraping. You can actually look at this and see there are different bands of scraping on that. And that was just so that I could actually work this plate into 90 degrees. So the goal was to get it, you know, I don't know. My goal is always like down to the one to two tenths, mm -hmm. you know, over six inches or so. But I don't, I don't do projects for NASA, so I just do it for <laughs> myself and people who ask me to do machine work. But, but um, that's a good example of a, a, a simple project to learn on for yes. anybody that wants to practice this at home. Right. And so if you look at this, this was, this was done by hand, and one of the things we'll talk about when Adam's scraping over there, or Adam and I are scraping together, is it, hopefully the camera will pick up consistency. Every, hopefully, every cut in here, every carbide scrape is, a, is approximately the same width, approximately the same length, um, approximately the same depth, and it's consistent across the whole surface. That way you can predictably know where you are, where you're going, how it's gonna measure. One of the easiest ways, now this little surface plate, um, let me slide this here. This was one of the early projects I did and it's kind of war because I've used it for different things. It's hard to see the pattern and I didn't really scrape this for like a use plate. It was probably scraped at two to three tenths, maybe four ten thousandths per scrape mark. And that, that's not gonna have a lot of wearability. The average, if you're working on a machine, you want to be somewhere between four and six tenths of depth. And we'll show that over on the other plate, how you can actually measure that with a simple surface gauge. Okay. okay? So, um, and, but I wanna show what I consider to be one of the you know, best projects that helped me really learn and make something useful. So we were talking about this sort of uh, rectangular channel that I found and I didn't know what it was and I actually texted Adam and I'm like, what is this? It's cast iron, it's gotta be something tunnel useful. Block. And so here we have a tunnel block, he told me. And, um, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna scrape this out and get it as precise as I possibly can. Well, at the time I had a hand scraper and I had a, a surface gauge, actually this one. I'm sure the gentleman who made this is long gone. His name was etched on there. But it's a cute little surface gauge. And so the first thing I did with this project was I scraped one surface flat. And yes, you do need a master plate of some sort, whether you buy a small, and this is one of those circumstances where I'm not against someone going out and buying a nice A or double A grade shards small granite if they want to do this. You don't have to go out and buy a Starrett or a Standridge plate to get into this. They, they need a, a good flat reference though yes. to test this stuff on. Right. And we'll show that. I mean, I've got a couple of service plates. I'm leaning on one right now. Folks, don't worry about this service plate. It's a three foot by six foot pink granite. It looks awful. Um, it's it's going to be lapped and brought back to all its glory here in the future. It's not and up so, to Hans's, uh, no. Par right now. No. So the first thing I did on this was I scraped one surface flat, mastered it to a granite plate, and, and this, uh, actually this, this is pretty good. And if you've seen me on Instagram, I did a little quickie on my stones. If they're flat and mastered to, the, to a good granite and you hinge them, the, the center rotation should be about 30% in from each end. And this is subjective, but, um, but these will be your hinge points on a flat surface. So I scraped one side flat. And so then I'm like, well, I want to make this square in all directions. Where do I go from there? So the next thing that I did was I, I quickly, very quickly scraped the other side flat in a plane that I thought would be parallel with the first side. So now I have two flat sides. Well, they could be parallel, they could be V-shaped, up or down. I mean, who knows? So the next task I did was to scrape flat the bottom surface, and now how are we gonna test these two sides 
and the bottom. Well, the first thing we can do is scrape the first side flat, put it down on my granite surface plate. I can take a um, gauge block of some sort and I can lay it on here and then I can take a surface gauge that's prepped. This is prepped for another thing. And I can run that whole surface and I can determine if the bottom surface and the top surface are parallel to each other. And I can determine within what you know, error that is over that whole surface. You're talking about sweeping the indicator yep. across. Yeah, I would on, be. It would be on top of a little gauge block. Correct. So I'm going to grab your cap over here. Pretend that's a gauge block. And the reason we want to do that is there's individual cuts in here. And remember, each of these could be half a thousandth deep in that yep. poor little, you know, tense. Mm -hmm dial there is going to be just jumping all over the planet. So you want a gauge block that's going to average all the high spots out and then you just sweep that whole top. So we have one face flat and then we can scrape this face so that it's parallel, can measure it, we're good to go. Then we scrape this bottom and set it up. So if we know these two sides are parallel, how do we get to know that the bottom's perpendicular. And that's where you can set up a simple surface gauge like this, put the ball at the bottom. You, what you need to really do, and I know there are guys out there that do high precision work, but I'm just talking about the average guy who wants to do really good work in his shop. Right. Take a simple, this is like a little stare at, you know, precision um, angle gauge, and just line up the center of the ball with the tip is that showing? Yeah. 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 So yeah. you want the center of that ball to be as close to, to the center of the uh, indicator tip as possible. All right. So they're in the same vertical plane. Now I can, what I can do is I can set this up such that when I bring the surface gauge up to our measurable surface, I can sweep this back and forth and look for my highest reading. So it's coming up to about nine tenths there. It's tough because remember, I'm shaking a little bit. Your apprentice is nervous, Adam. <laughs> but what we're gonna do is take our highest reading on that side, okay? And so let's just say that's eight tenths for the sake of this video. We're, we're not doing this for a project. And then we're going to flip this around and measure the other side. Do the same thing, okay? So we're getting the same thing, about 8, 9 tenths. Well, if you're getting equal readings on both sides, then you know that these two are in the same plane. If this was scraped such that the bottom was causing this box to angle this way, you get higher readings on this side, mm -hmm. lower readings on this side. And so, Again, nothing fancy. Dial indicator tense gauge, little inexpensive surface gauge, a piece of cast iron that's rectangular square shape. You can do it like your camera's setting on a nice bush. Yep, we got another one over here. Yeah. The sitting on. <laughs> yeah. And so and so you can do that with all sides then. Yeah. Super simple. You can do it at home. Anybody yeah. can. Yeah. It's a great practice project right there. Frank. This little project taught me more about scraping and moving um, apart than any other project that I've done since. Because it taught me how I can change the dimensions of something. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, how many sides are there? Six sides. Yeah. And they're all, you know, plus or minus, let's say two tenths maybe, but definitely two tenths. So, um,. We just moved the whole show over to a, one of my workbenches here, and it's actually where I scrape. A lot of times I will use these wooden top tables to um, screw two by fours or vices down to, and, and it's a good height. And then this table actually will lower or raise, because being in the right position to scrape is so important. For this video, I'm going to scrape here. I would like to be about two inches lower. I'm a little high right now, but I think it's going to be perfect for your structure okay. when, when we when you start scraping. And he's making me start scraping, so um, yeah, I wanted him to do it so that I could critique him. But, um, but why would we even want to scrape anything to begin with? And I think it's really important for those of you who follow along um, when I put the shaper in, one of the first things I did was I looked at the ram and the dovetails and it had some scoring and um, there was even some galling on the flats of the top of the casting. 
And so, and I could only see a hint of scrape marks in there. And, and so the first thing I did was I pulled that ram, cleaned it all up, and then I just went and pattern scraped the whole thing for, for oil retention. Because like you can take a, a, a piece of cast iron, if it'll fit on a grinder, and there's some big grinders. If anybody saw my planer being ground up at Kinetic, there's yeah. some big grinders. Oh yeah. But not every piece of equipment is easily moved and put on a grinder. But, but let's just say that they could be, and you had two ground surfaces next to each other. They could be so flat that if you put them together, they'd pretty much, when you put oil in there, they would remove most of the air, and they would stick mm -hmm. like nobody's business. So they really would have a high coefficient of friction, I guess. Somebody who's a physics major will, will correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> with that term. But they would have a high level of friction, and they won't, wouldn't want to move easily back and forth. Yeah. And so they'll get like... Uh, slipstick, mm -hmm. I think it's called, where a machine wears out, there's really no pocketing for the oil and the machine doesn't want to move or, or you're trying to get that last little bit on the lathe yeah. to get that saddle to move a little bit and, and it's sticking and then boom, you go too far. Yeah. And so the beauty of, of scraping, whether it be with a bi power scraper or by hand, is you have all these wonderful little pockets. You, have a, a, you, you can really get ultra precise with your flat planes because you're going to have references whether your reference is a large granite uh, table or, or or straight straight edge I don't, I don't know if those straight edges are probably not in the view but we'll, we'll show them as so they'll right so whether them. you're bringing the part to a granite to do your testing or whether you're bringing a reference that has been mastered to a granite to your part um, you can get them incredibly flat and that's really the short story and then you have in in cases where um, where you have movement, you have that pocketing, and then you can get oil in those pockets. I mean, that, and, and the longevity is, is excellent. Now, I'm a I'm a big fan of turkite because it's quick to scrape, and you get the same benefits. It's got that um, um, you know, it's a sort of a I think a copper embedded. Um, Teflon product or something like that. Somebody will correct us in the bottom, but but turkite or rulon, but it'll do the same thing. So and that's a material that's added to a machine surface that's worn, or in a lot of cases they actually put them on the factory. And, mm -hmm. uh, but if you've got a if you've got say a, a lathe carriage that's uh, wore out and you need to build that surface back mm -hmm. up, you can put turkite on it. Yes, and then mm -hmm. scrape the turkite in. Mm -hmm. I just helped a friend do a big Thompson grinder. Um, I say big, big to me. It was like um, 42 inch magnet by, I don't remember, maybe 24 by 42, I don't remember. And a big heavy table and we turkited the bottom of it. Super cool. fast to do. Scraped the bed uh -huh. in and got it to within two tenths across the whole surface and then turkited it. It was, it was really great. He's super stoked about it. So that going back to what you were saying, so you can, if you've got a machine, say at home, that you can't, you, maybe you can't afford to, you don't have the means to take that bed of that lathe to a grinder to get them to grind those ways. You can do this right here at home. You can rebuild that machine and get it back to specs yourself by just hand scraping it. You can, and, and, and even in some cases, uh, you know, you, you think about hardened ways, you really probably shouldn't, you, you, but you can. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have the will and the strength to yep. do it, um, you know, but definitely guys that have like the South Bends and the small lays that, you know, they're really nice and they're mm -hmm. perfect for home use or small, uh, small shops maybe can use them. Yeah. Um, a lot of those uh, ways are not hardened and you, yeah. they're easy to scrape. That Boyer Schultz surface grinder that I just sold, yeah. that was a great project. Well, a lot yeah. of milling machines too. The milling yeah. machine yeah. saddles and the knees, right. you know, they're, right. they're just cast iron machines so you can scrape those in. Yeah, and that's a very common rebuild is a, like a Bridgeport mill. Right. So something I wanted to cover again. We're, I know I'm going to repeat a couple of things, Adam, but this is sort of the basic setup that I started with, and um, you know, I read about it, and then Richard King reinforced it when I trained with him initially. Um, your own hand scraper, you can build it with, um, you know, just buy a good carbide uh, end. Um, this is the 20 by 150 and it has the 60 millimeter radius on it 
it's just an all around, you know, 80, 90% of what I've done so far in the last couple of years has been with just this setup. Um, you know, obviously I've added a power by X, a power scraper to it. Um, I've watched a couple other um, YouTubers, you know, talk about this subject and I want to really emphasize that keep it super simple. Get one scraper. Don't have three or four different scrapers, you know, different carbides with different radiuses. You need to learn consistency and um, know what you're capable of before you start I think branching out and, and using other pieces of equipment. And definitely if you have three scrapers, you're roughing with one and you know, sort of bringing it into your finish and then finishing with the third one. I think that's almost impossible for a beginner to learn. Okay. I know there's a lot of talented people out there. And we, this was one of the plates we did on the shaper this weekend. Yep. And, um, and so, you know, typically you would take a part like this, it would have some wear somewhere in it, you would take it to a grant service plate or you would bring a reference device to it and you might take shim stock or feeler gauges and figure out where is all the wear. Where's all the wear? And, um, and, and, and then blew it up and look and see where the work needed to be done. And you would typically, if you're doing it for a living, get a fairly wide tool with a big radius and then you would cut pretty much the whole surface until it was close to one plane. You wouldn't care how many parts or uh, contact points per inch, you just get it all in one plane really quickly. Well, that's what the shaper did for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then you would come back and, um, you know, this is a little intimidating, Adam. Like, I don't scrape in front of people, especially for a video camera. I, I don't and, either. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm comfortable scraping. And, and basically what I would do then is if I was roughing, I would be taking 5 eighths to 3 quarter inch cuts and they would be two to three times wider than this with a bigger blade. If I was really trying to get some material down so I could get it in one plane. Yeah. Right here I'm kind of in that in-between stage. Let's assume we've measured this and now if you can you get close up on those? I just did a row of scrape marks there. Um, and I'm not taking heavy cuts here. I'm just taking probably these are probably two three tenths cuts. I can tell by the feel of the scraper. Um, and if, if you zoomed in on that? Yeah, I've got okay. it zoomed in. So there's nothing perfect about this, but consistency is the key. You want, you want the spacing between each of those to be about the same width as each of your cuts, and you want the depth to be all the same. And so that's sort of the basics of scraping. So consistency, like I keep coming back to that, and, and if you'll notice um, for this particular and I'm only taking like quarter inch almost close to finishing cuts and so it's really about and guys I do not hand scrape that much anymore I, I did for a couple of years and I'm a lazy power scraper user now. <laughs> so a couple of things to note here. So my cuts are too close technically if I was a machine and I could dial it in. Should be a little more spacing between them because I'm again I'm past the roughing stage on this. We're assuming that we're in that intermediate period where we're trying to get to finishing with high point count. Um, you'll notice that I'm pushing up a burr and you'll notice that I'm actually working near to far. If you work near to far and you overlap, which I'm not doing a very good job, you can actually cut your previous burr off. So when you get to the end, you basically have very few burrs. Okay. So it's easier to stone the surface. And so I will, I'm not going to do this whole plate because I'll be tired and you guys will have fell asleep on video. Um, so, so you would finish this the whole way across and then I would come back and I'm just going to do it right here and pretend this is my new corner. And then I'm going to come back and add a 90 degrees and I'm going to come back and cross cut this the other way. Okay. So some key takeaways, I'm not going to finish that. And you'll see right here that telltale appearance of that checkerboard pattern that most people are used to seeing. And so, again, every job you're doing is a different mission 
and you're going to scrape it out to a different point count and contact. If you're doing um, a saddle for a lathe bed, you're probably going to want to scrape that out to 20 points per inch, maybe 25, depends on how like anal retentive you are. My 10 E out there is stupid scraped, like it's it's way beyond what is necessary and it will wear for a lifetime and a half. It's got turkite on it, you know, it'll never get the use to wear it out probably. Um, and probably, you know, 40-50% contact with that. Because it's just not the, the number of points that are blowing up, it's also the total surface area that's contacting in that particular piece of machinery or equipment between the two objects that must spend their life together. And so that's sort of the basics. The, just the great thing about the power scraper is it doesn't make you as tired. You get it done a little bit faster than the yeah, scraper. Yeah, yeah, a lot faster. And so, um, but what you saw me do here was sort of uh, probably 70% of the way through Adam's plate. This is sort of how I was actually working on your um, your dad's and granddad's surface plate. Yeah. Um, so when you start, I started to say this before, you're probably, you know, if this, if you're roughing this out, trying to get it all in, in the same basic plane, you're going to be taking cuts that are uh, 5 eighths to 3 quarters of an inch long, probably going to be twice as wide as this, larger radius tool. And as you work towards finishing it, if let's say your goal was 40 points per inch, you're going to have to probably get down to a 40 radius. Okay. Yeah, and I'm doing that from memory. You know, somebody can correct me. But the bottom line is you could be starting up with a 120 radius tool and, you know, be ending with a 40 radius tool. When you get down to those narrower radii, you'd have to have the experience with that because you're taking much smaller cuts. It's easier to tilt the blade and gouge the work. And again, that's why mentors are so important. Somebody who's standing right there with you watching your work. Even today with a biax when I'm cutting a, uh, a V-way, I have to be really careful. It's easy to roll that blade over and put a gouge in the work. It's, is it the end of the world? No, I just say it's a great place for more oil to go. But, <laughs> but it's really not what you want to try to achieve. Um, so I'm trying to think of anything else we can cover with the basic scraping. Again, I'm trying to talk to the guys out there that are like, oh, I don't know if I want to, I want to start scraping, but I really don't know where to get started. So, a couple of things you guys will notice um, about the power scraper is, it, first of all, this thing is variable speed. And so, depending on how fast you want to traverse your project, you can vary that speed. You know, if you're just starting out, you, you probably want to keep that thing around three or below because you, you, the faster this thing cycles, the faster your lateral movement needs to be. And because this actually in this last pass, I did a pretty good job of equally spacing my cuts to my blanks. But if, uh, if you guys notice that, gosh, you can get five times the amount of work done in the same time yeah. with a power scraper. I might have the stroke length on this, a little bit over half an inch, half an inch plus or minus. And um, it really makes for for short work of your scraping. I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but one tool, get a 60 radius, make sure it's flexible because you need to be able to feel what you're doing. Your depth of cut is definitely determined by the amount of pressure you put on your tool. Your width of cut will be determined partially by pressure, but a lot with respect to the radius of the tool. But this is a good middle of the ground way to start. And then, of course, if you get into it and you're excited and have the money to come across a used Biax, I'd tell you to do that. Mm -hmm. It's been a little while since I've done this, so yeah. I'll fill out a practice here. Let's see.
Need a little practice there, buddy. Yeah, no, you, that's fantastic. I gotta tell him the story about you flaking at some point. Yeah, yours is a lot more straight than mine, I think. I've done a few recently. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've been on it for a while, but that gives a, you can see the, uh, definitely see the, the cast yeah. iron there. All right. And you were putting more pressure than I was. I have to check this. The other thing we should do before, you know, to include in the video is to go over to, the, to how these are sharpened and right. discuss the angles and yeah. uh, the basics of that. And okay. So, um, but so we should, should we go ahead and uh, I go the other way with it now? Yeah, just for, so they can see the pattern. See, just yeah. start there maybe and just come back across the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. in a way that suits you. Starting to see a little pattern in there. That looks fantastic. I mean, I can't believe you haven't picked up power scraper since <laughs> what was since it? a class. couple of years ago. Yeah, it's yeah. been uh, it's been January of seven, six, seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah, it was seventeen. So there's a little bit, a little bit closer shot of the uh, just a little bit of sample scraping, just to kind of give you a better idea of what it's what it's looking like there. Okay, so the subject of sharpening carbide, uh, the, really, for this, for the purposes of scraping, I think the the best way to do it is with a diamond embedded wheel or something that's diamond. One of the first things that I'll point out is if you can focus in here and notice that this uh, table is set at five degrees. So it's set at a, a negative five degrees. The front of this is an important distinction because it can get confusing. The, the front of this table is higher than the back of the table or the part of the table that's nearest to the diamond wheel. This is a Glendo called an AccuFinish. And yes, most folks aren't going to go out and spend six or eight hundred dollars for a Glendo. You don't need to. You can buy a diamond a less expensive diamond wheel, Shars, one of these companies, you can mount it to a regular grinder. It's a little fast. You'll notice when I turn this on, this rotates much slower than like um, a tool grinder. But if you have an old double end grinder, you can buy a diamond wheel and sharpen your um, carbide even at 1750, you know, at a high RPM. I clock this one and the other one and they average between 280 and 320 RPM. I've got a diamond wheel on my Valdor carbide grinder, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I used whenever I was practicing. Seemed to work good. Yeah, I just, yeah. Set, I just set the table at the uh, mm -hmm. negative angle and, and use that. And it, the other it, it looks it looks just like that. Yeah, my wheel. the other unnamed <laughs> machinist mentor that I have, or rebuilding mentor I have um, sold me that, and maybe I don't know that we'll have time to show the collection of stuff I was able to, to buy from him, but. Um, this is a 900 grit, and I'll talk about grits in a minute, but this is what he used pretty much, you know, for many, many, many years, and he swears by this. Okay. So I don't know what he had this mount on. This looks like a hub for a surf grinder, so I'm not really sure. But at the end of the day, um, something that will spin a diamond wheel that uh, can create a fine finish on carbide. This happens to be a 600 grit. The uh, Gundo Corporation makes them from, I think, 240 or 280 up to 12 or 1600 maybe, probably even higher. I'm just not aware of it. Um, uh, Richard King taught us that 600 grit is sort of the good middle grit for general use. Okay. So if you're doing most of your work, a 600 grit wheel is fine. We're going to grind two edges. Um, on this piece of carbide. We're going to maintain that radius. This is still another 60 radius tool. Um, 
if you'll notice this wheel is spinning counterclockwise and we're actually grinding the upper edge so the wheel is actually spinning into the carbide mm -hmm. the edge that we're actually grinding the the, the, the wheel is actually pushing the carbide t down into itself yeah. the reason for that is is if you were to flip this around change this angle five degrees this way and you are grinding the bottom edge carbide's fragile and listen I'm not going to explain the science I'm not qualified but my understanding is if we were to grind off this bottom edge you're probably going to be chipping it out exactly because right? it's real brittle and I, my understanding is you get a lot of micro fractures along that edge yep. and it will not be sharp yep. and it will affect your cuts yep. okay yep. so it's that's why this table looks like it's tilted up and I'm not going to do it here I'm just going to make a pass but I keep these little chem bottles with these square nose you know needles and 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 little condom covers here and I'll soak that down with WD-40 okay. you don't really want to dry grind this I will it's gonna make a little bit of a mess this isn't normally where I would sharpen I have a, a shelf over there where I keep all the messy stuff um, and then you know I'm basically just gonna follow the radius of this preformed tool and slowly polish I, I don't really want to call it grinding because I don't want anybody to have the image that we're actually like hogging off like you would do a high-speed tool I've watched Adam this weekend do some high-speed tool he should have been a sculptor it's just incredible what he can do on a on a grinder but um, and then this tool will get flipped over and you know rinse and repeat and I'm going to always try to cover the face of the diamond wheel so we're wearing it relatively evenly. So how do we know if it's sharp? Well, I'm going to show you here in one second. Look at the, look at the end and you can see the polish, right? Yeah, and like when I'm doing finishing something, especially something that I want to either be absolutely beautiful or high precision, like some sort of a gauge. Now if you look, I don't know if the camera will pick that up, you should be able to see a reflective two facets with a ridge in the middle. And and the surface should look extraordinarily polished. Now I shouldn't say extraordinarily because that's a 600. If we went up into the high grit range, yeah, take that because I'm going to take my glove off and show how to tell if that's sharp. Okay, so once you think you have it sharp, if you'll just lay the carbide on your thumbnail and just slowly go across and it will peel, you can see it's peeling, and I'm not putting any, just so you guys know, I'm not putting any down pressure hardly at all, and it will just peel the, it, this isn't super sharp, but it's, it's getting there. It'll take a little bit of your fingernail right off without any effort. You'll know that's sharp enough. Again, we're talking about the guys, you guys that are learning and um, just beginning to show an interest or be interested in this sort of shop work. It's just that simple. Um, but again, don't don't I don't want anybody to think you need a Glendo to do that because you just don't every now and then if you keep your eye peeled you'll find one of these for a couple hundred bucks get lucky you know so Lance wants to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, tools of the trade when it comes to uh, scraping and you know having uh, reference surface tools and things like that so this is some of some of his uh, collection here he likes to he likes to collect these tools yeah <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, it's an awesome collection. Some of them you've worked on. It looks like this one you've scraped in, right? Yeah. So this yeah. is a straight edge here. This is yeah. one that you probably bought. And then uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about it. He just purchased a lot of tooling from a retired uh, precision machinist and a rebuilder. Yeah. I think I, I, I don't remember the company that he told me he worked for and just developing a relationship with him right now. I haven't mentioned his name just because I didn't ask permission. I think I said that earlier, but um, 
all of his tools and over uh, Adam's right shoulder is like on the floor is full of stuff that I like, got. Uh, there's a six, stuff. six foot brown and sharp straight edge like this, a four foot one to match it. This is a three foot. I have a, another three foot like this that I've scraped out. Well, I didn't really need to do much. It was in such good condition when I bought it. Um, and I really like, for whatever reason, I like these brown and sharp straight edges, but um, they don't have dovetails on them. This one is a Richard King, so Kingway Consultants. Um, Richard still has these straight edges cast. They're great. You know, he's a great resource. Obviously, he teaches a scraping class. Um, this is September 2019. Yeah. January of 2020. There will be a scraping class here in Florida, not at my shop, but feel free to reach out and ask questions. Um, it's already scheduled, but just so I don't get the details wrong, I'm not going to do it here. Just if anybody wants to know, let, let me know and I will okay. get you in touch with uh, the gentleman who's hosting that. But uh, this is one of Richard's um, straight edges that I scraped out. This is mastered to one of my A granite plates. Um, yeah, so anyway, I painted it blue. I really don't like the blue. It may get repainted one day, but I, I didn't have a blue shirt is. So there we go, that's my only excuse. This actually was it was um, made by that retired machine rebuilder. Um, and this is a, a version of what's called the Kingway. And it's actually a way to measure machine tools in terms of um, ways. So if you have a V-way and a flat way, on a lathe, a grinder, um, you know, two dovetail ways on a milling machine, anything. This can actually be used to measure. We're not going to go into that for this video. It's actually math and a, a little bit complex, but uh, teachable. That's not for this video. This is a bush, which a lot of people know about. You know, bush actually, uh, I think, went under, and there was a big auction a year ago or so. Um, but somebody bought the Bush name and still produces some of this. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I learned that actually when I took my planer up to a cache. So this is an example of a prism uh, straight edge. I actually made this out of Durbar. And so when cool. I was doing uh, my first lathe project, I wanted a, it's about 16 inches long. I wanted a, um, you know, small dovetail so I didn't have to carry one of these larger ones around. Um, and so, yeah, I let this dirt bar set for a few months and then, you know, it's kind of young, but I've scraped it multiple times. It was heavily used by Mr. Rucker <laughs> huh. um, until he got a longer a dovetail straight edge. So you can see there's a lot of wear in that and this actually probably needs to be re-scraped. So, and you would use something like this or even one of these to check yeah. your uh, dovetail, say, Bridgeport mill, the knee. Bridgeport mill. Yeah, this actually is kind of classically used for the knee. Yeah. Right there, that size. And show them the side here. Yeah, you yeah. See, you so see the, the dovetail. I think when you did my shop tour, I was talking about that, where I got that thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. It's a bush straight edge. It's going to be great. And then when I printed it on my granite plate, it was awful. Oh, really? It was, it was like a banana. Huh. So I had to actually... Um, I had to do a lot of work on that to actually make that um, in good shape. Over here, this is um, a, a, a magnetic cylinder square. Um, there's some marks on this because we know it's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty close. An example of what you might do with this would be, let's say you're um, working on a angle block. What we'll do it here, and I set that up. You would um, go ahead and you could stick this on the face of that. I'm not going to do this because, you know, we, time is precious. But, uh, and you would set this up so you could sweep this. Oh, maybe I can do it real quick. So you could sweep one end, then you come out here, and you would sweep the other end and see how close it was. Now, we don't know. Which, well, that's not even on. But anyway, so... This could actually talk, this actually will help you measure squareness. Yeah. It, it has a bazillion other uses, but that's one that's, of the primary one that we use it That's for. a great example for okay. what you would use when you're trying mm -hmm. to square up a, a workpiece there, yep. a tool. So that's how, so this one was done. This was actually one of the early ones I did after I got that, and that's actually how I squared this up.
But yeah, and I was going to say that. So if you have one of these type of squares here, if you're trying to scrape an angle plate perfectly 90 degrees, mm -hmm. then you would put a square like this on this face yep. and do your checking to see if, if you're off any yeah. And something that I want to show just real quick is if you took and you were measuring this, so let's say you swept it here, come out here, if, if your angle here was was essentially less than 90 degrees, this end's going to be higher because it's going to be kicked up, right? Yep. So let's just say, and part of the reason these X's are on here is this is a self-checking or self-calibrating tool. You can take this, sweep here, sweep here, look at your measurements, and then turn this 180 degrees and you should get exactly the same measurement. Yes. Otherwise, if this, this is ground true. Th correct. That isn't ground square if it doesn't yep. if it doesn't self check. So just other little things. And again, that was stuff I learned when I took a scraping class. Yeah. For two. Show them your little uh, angle plate right here. This is a little project you've been working on. Yeah, this is like you know when there's nothing else to do. This is a little cheap. I think I just bought this off of eBay. Maybe I, I don't remember. A uh, little adjustable angle plate that you could use, and so. Um, I started scraping it. This face is done. Let's see this. Yeah. Right here, give him a good shot. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, this face needs a little bit of work. But so is this? You it's where we started it. Yes, yeah, it's okay. done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not done yet. But um, and then once this is done, this is a cool little project because, you know, the, these really are. You're going to be really too concerned about is the flatness. Right, this oh, is an adjustable. You could just scrape those two faces and have a really useful tool because you're going to set the angle yourself when yeah. you do a setup. What I'll probably do is this face yeah. and this face will be square. So I'll be yeah. you know, measuring that. And that's yeah. actually pretty easy to do because this is so short. Yeah. It's easy to adjust. Yeah. So, that's a quick one, right? There. Yeah. Um, so so much square. And then these are like, you know, serious rebuilders tools. These are um, column squares. And so let's just say that you were working on a column and you can show, I'll show it over here on the Square Master for like the column of a surface grinder. And it had to be perpendicular to the base. So this is magnetic, I'm not gonna stick it onto the side of my Square Master. Um, but this would actually help you, once the, the entire machine was leveled, this would actually help you align the column to the machine. So one of these, there are two different kinds. One, one of these is to rough, kind of, so this is um, 5 tenths per 10 inches, and then the other one is below it is the one that will drive you crazy, it's 2 tenths. <laughs> wow, so, even, even yeah, closer. Yeah, so it's even a higher precision. And then this is, a, this is another sort of, you know, not machinist ultra precision level, but it's a precision level that uh, the gentleman on that did the rebuilding. It's a Weiler, so it's a really top quality. But it has an adjustment that will allow you to compensate. So if you were testing a machine and the machine itself wasn't perfectly level, but you wanted to measure down a set of ways, you could actually you can actually dial in a level here to get the to get the bubble where you want it. So you don't really have to do a lot of work on the base of the machine in order to sort of pre-screen or measure the machine to know what kind of work you need to have done. Okay. So it's a really cool sort of system that he set up there. And the Kingways are wonderful. Um, Keith Rucker's probably shown on his channel. Yeah, but he's got a Kingway, an actual Kingway. He has an actual Kingway, or most of one, because I think there's a few parts missing, but, okay. but he's got an actual Kingway and the vials are built into it. Yeah. And those are fantastic, but I thought this was a cool take on it. And you can see the guy that built this, he actually scraped the aluminum so that I'm sure he mastered that to something. And um, so that this, when this set down on there, he knew he was setting on a repeatable scraped surface. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to wrap up this video and uh, kind of give you a, a, a very slight introduction into a scraping and then the tools and you know what it's used for and uh and then of course small projects that anybody can do in their garage or in their home shop to uh, start getting you you know associated and understanding what the uh, scraping is but 
<clears throat> what we wanted to say is that if, uh, depending on how this video turns out and, and uh, if there's a, if there's an interest there, you know, let us know if you have any questions, throw them in the comment section. Lance said that he would, uh, you know, go through there and read some of the comments and questions and try to answer any, anything that people might be wanting to know. But also, if there is a good interest, maybe we can come back and do some more in-depth videos later of uh, scraping and projects, maybe even show some scraping on a machine. And, and we didn't talk about bluing, you know, how you, how you check your, your scraping pattern, your flatness, but I think that would be for another video there as well. Yeah, I think, it, I think I said somewhere in the beginning of this that I didn't want to bore people to death. Like, I just <laughs> wanted to give them an introduction and hopefully motivate the people that are sitting on the fence to go do it. Yeah. And yeah. if anybody out there is really interested, just you know, drop a comment or reach out to me. I'm easily found. Don't don't be upset if I don't get right back to you because I am super busy. You're right you're now. a busy man, like a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I'm willing to help folks. Um, and and again, if there is more interest, we'll do more. But my yeah. objective was n not to come here as an expert, but to sort of share my journey and learning mm -hmm. this trade and then uh, hopefully get other people motivated to want to do it yeah you know and yeah i think uh if you if you start learning how to do this and learn the fundamentals you guys can start rebuilding your machines in your garage you really can i mean it is a bit intimidating and the reason i said at the beginning to get a mentor and maybe even get a little formal training if you can swing it financially is it'll catapult your confidence into a place where you'll get great you'll have good success and then you'll uh, geometrically improve and do more. Uh, but if you get frustrated, it's like anything else. If you don't really know what you're doing and you get frustrated and you don't have anybody to help you, then you just tend not to do it. Yeah. But it's not, it is not overly difficult, but I think you do, you need help. You need somebody to sort of. I would agree with that. Guidance, yeah. so. I, I enjoy taking the class and learning the basics and uh, uh, I really want to uh, study it a little bit more and practice more myself too start getting a little bit better at it and more familiar with it. So. The, third, the 30 second story from Adam, I remember from the, the class we took. What's this, guy, that? Th this guy picked up the um, hand flaker. He'd never done it. And like in two minutes, he was hand flaking as good as Richard King was. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I struggle today to hand flake. I don't even do it. I just use the power a flaker. Really? Like I, I, don't, I, don't, I won't even hand flake. Yeah. Yeah, but somehow you just uh, that just made sense to you. I remember you yeah, doing that. Yeah. And that's so. like the that the uh the half moon half moon flake pattern right. that you would cut in after you scrape yep. that helps put the oil pockets yep. into your surface. Yeah. That's a lot of times what you what you're looking at on a lot of machines like my G and E shaper is the same way. It looks like a scraped surface, but it's not really a scraped surface, just it's just flaked to put the pattern in there for the oil. Yep, it just gives lots of little pockets for the oil to hang out and keep yep. everything slippery. So, yep. yeah, put put comments at the bottom if you guys are interested. If Adam gets enough um, enthusiasm and, and views on this, I, I'm happy to 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 whatever I know share and and feel free to reach out to me. I stay in touch with the folks with Richard and other people who are interested in this and do classes, um, and I'm happy to give everybody the information if I have it. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, hope you guys enjoyed and uh, leave us a comment. Tell us what you think and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Okay. Mm -hmm.